Carla.
Welcome everyone, I'm Flavia, Executive Director of the 55 Project, a non-profit organization with a mission to promote Brazilian visual arts and cultural projects in the US. Tonight is our first live and I'm very honored to start this conversation talking by Lina Bubard. For this conversation, we have here Lina Bubard's biographer, educator, writer, curator, Zellner Lima, and the Marilyn and Larry Fields curator at the MCA Chicago, Carla Acevedo Yates. I'd like to thank all members and sponsors who make our programs happen. I'd like to thank you for being here tonight. Welcome, Carla and Zellner. Hello, thank you very much for organizing this conversation. Thank you so much, Flavia, for the invitation. Well, um, we started the conversation, Carla and myself, two months ago, more or less, before COVID interrupted our conversation and um, the work that we're starting to do together at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. So uh, when Flavia invited me to have this conversation, which really honors me, I thought immediately about continue the conversation that I started with Carla, which was extremely exciting being with her curatorial uh, team. Um, we spent a whole afternoon nonstop talking. <laughs> and so yeah. I'm very pleased. I'm also very uh, honored that Carla has accepted to uh, continue the conversation. So. No, thank you, Soiler. I think we, we really had a wonderful time and I discovered so much about Leader through your scholarship, and I'm really excited to continue this conversation. And, and just to like um, give our online viewers a little structure, we're going to start with a really brief introduction by Soiler. We're going to have a conversation, and then we're going to spend some time um, um, answering some questions from from the audience. Um, so we can go ahead and start with that introduction, and we can start the conversation. I think maybe Soiler has some technical difficulties. Are you okay, Soiler? Yes, I'm back. <laughs> okay, you're back. Okay, so maybe we can start with the introduction and then we'll jump into our conversation and then we can like take some questions from our online audience. Okay, thank you. And I'd like to ask Fan to, who is in Sao Paulo, we're in so many different places, to uh, start the live slideshow so we can um, just give a brief introduction and to Lina Bobardi. Fan, could you please? Wonderful. So um, some of you may know uh, who Lina Bobardi was. Some of you may not know. She was, um, I believe, one of the most important um, architects in the 20th century, but until very recently, not very well known. So this is what one of I was attracted to uh, research her life and her work. And here's a picture that she took. She's very happy arriving in Milan uh, in around 1940. And uh, when she was uh, 25 years old and uh, she had moved from Rome, where she was born in 1914. She studied in Rome and she moved to Milan um, to continue her career. And But as she said, everything was destroyed and nothing was built during this time because uh, she moved to Milan exactly when the city started to be bombarded during the war. And uh, so her youth was mostly spent uh, during fascism and during the Second World War. And her career as an architect started mostly as an illustrator, as an editor for magazine. And I think that these two pictures show a little bit of her character. One of them is that she was very, uh, strong-minded and very decided, very irreverent, but like this one is showing, very romantic, uh, a very uh, delicate person, but also very intense at the same time. So with all this uh, experience that she had in Italy, the education she had, very specific to Europe and also very specific to um, uh, her own country, she moved to Brazil in 1946 after having married um, Pietro Maria Bardi, who was a journalist and art collector. And uh, 
I have another image, if Fan can uh, include it for us, which is a drawing she made just three days after she arrived in Rio uh, in October of 1946. And I personally loved this drawing. This really represents a world for collective life. And uh, she was very interested in plants and nature. She was also very interested in um, uh, what happens uh, in the life of the people who inhabit these places. And if you ever have the chance to look close at these drawings, there's so much activity and uh, there's so many different cultural backgrounds. I think it is perhaps the epitome of her um, what she called, you know, the anger and the hope of having survived the war in Europe and having moved to Brazil. And so the subsequent uh, drawings uh, show a little bit of her activities and, uh, and the kinds of projects, the ideas about architecture that she had, if um, Fan can help us. Uh, she and her husband, uh, who you can see her in a self-portrait, he is sitting next to her, Pietro Mariardi, in her idealized house, which is a glass house in the middle of the trees. And um, this was a time, the first decade they moved to Brazil between 1946 and 56, when he created the Museum of Modern, of Art of Sao Paulo, which is a little bit like the MoMA of Brazil. And um, so they were very dedicated to three activities. One was the museum itself. She curated a lot of shows. She designed the shows in the museum and all the facilities and um, a magazine called Habitat that they produced and edit and um, a, um, a design school that was very much based on uh, the Chicago Art Institute uh, School, which is very interesting because in Brazil until that moment, a lot of influences were European, they used to be very connected to the United States. And see, uh, as drawing, uh, fan please, if you can move to the next image, the house as um, it was uh, concluded. And uh, this is a, a picture taken recently that shows this glass box uh, flo floating in the middle of this, this woods. But one thing that most people don't know, know uh, knowing this house is a glass house, is that the house is very hybrid. If you look at the back of the house, it's actually, um, it looks like a country house. It looks like a, a vernacular house. and. Uh, it's uh, very important to understand these two aspects because her work was always very hybrid. Her mind was always in many different places and working with very different repertoires. And I believe that this is one of the reasons why it has been so difficult to pinpoint her and to frame her according to very specific um, terms of what modern architecture is. Um, and, and if we look at the next slide, please, we can see a house and uh, the next house. Fan, could you please? Um, the next house is, oh, sorry, this, I <laughs> didn't know it was here, but it was, you can, you can leave it there, please advance the picture. Uh, she also was very connected to the design of furniture and she designed this very famous bowl chair. I wanted to show this house because it was built uh, and designed for a friend of hers, uh, 300 meters away from her house. Uh, in 1957. And you would say, well, this is a completely different person. And this is because uh, she was very interested in uh, Antonio Gaudí's architecture, who is a very famous Catalan architect. And she was mesmerized by visiting his work in 1956 in Barcelona and uh, completely changed her way of looking at architecture. And uh, so you see, this is a very solid volume. There's no glass involved. Her ideas of modernism are more about simplification and a connection with a vernacular architecture, which has to do with her Italian mindset, than what we would call uh, modernism or uh, international style, which is much more commonly known in the United States or um, Latin America or even in Europe. So. Uh, maybe we can take a look at the next image, please. So uh, during this period that she was in Brazil after um, 19, the late 1950s, when she moved to Salvador, she left Sao Paulo after a decade having collaborated with her husband, and she went to become a director of an art museum 
uh, in Bahia, which is the state north uh, of Brazil. And I would say perhaps it's a little bit like a, mm, uh, New Orleans, uh, a very uh, interesting historical city, very grounded on African influences and a lot of uh, popular handcraft. And she organized a lot of very interesting exhibitions and dedicated a lot of I think we lost Soiler again for a little bit. Let's see if he can reconnect. I think you're back now. I'm sorry <laughs> for that. Uh, well, if we can continue, just I'll finish the last few slides. And um, so she was very interested in, um, Fanny, if you could return and move to the next uh, image. So she dedicated a lot of her work to understanding these uh, popular um, artifacts. And she tried to organize a museum dedicated to that. But then in 1964, there was a coup d'etat in Brazil and that completely changed the whole cultural political life of the country for another 25 years. And that also com completely changed her career itself and she had to come back to Sao Paulo. And in this mature phase of her work, we can see these three last slides, which are the perhaps most important works that she did. One of them is the Museum of Art of Sao Paulo, which you can see here, located in Sao Paulo on Paulista Avenue. It's this incredible, um, tense um, structure that is completely lifted from the ground. It's a span that is 276 feet wide. And inside there was this incredible, uh, innovative um, curatorial project, which is to place all the paintings on uh, glass uh, panels that were sitting in these concrete blocks that, as you can see here, made the works look like a constellation of stars or planets mm -hmm. just fluctuating in the middle of the space. Um, so, uh, and this is from 1968. Uh, and the last project that uh, perhaps is the uh, most important, uh, can you hear me? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, we hear so, you. Uh, oh, okay. So, and this is the last project that I wanted to highlight because it is perhaps the, um, the most important uh, uh, work that she did was like this Gesamtkunstwerk, uh, the total work of art, uh, in which uh, she uh, converted an old factory in Sao Paulo in a working class neighborhood for a very important institution called SESC, which I generally call the, y, the kind of um, unionized version of the YMCA. So it's a cultural and leisure and sports center. And then she designed these new structures, which contain sports courts on the left side, and uh, other facilities on the right, and they're connected with these amazing skywalks. And uh, she used to call the space uh, a, a gap of awe in her architecture. And it truly is sublime in this sense, but it also has, if you uh, ever spend a time, and I would recommend going to Sao Paulo just for this building and spending a whole day there, because it is full of surprises and full of beauty and, and full of life. And this is what I saw when I was a freshman in architecture school and I was absolutely mesmerized. And I said, oh, well, I didn't know that an architect could do such a thing. Mm -hmm. So um, this is just to locate, uh, you know, the audience not knowing who is out there. Uh, and so perhaps as a way of uh, continuing the conversation that we started when um, uh, Carla was uh, planning to organize an exhibition about Lina Bobardi in Chicago. So thank you. Yeah, that's right. Thank you so much for that um, introduction, Soiler. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things that I wanted to backtrack and maybe talk about is this idea of hybridity that you mentioned. And I remember during our conversation that you quoted Lina saying, I did not make myself alone, which I think it's such a mm -hmm. beautiful phrase that really synthesizes basically all her life and work. And she did collaborate a lot throughout her life, starting in Milan and then coming into Sao Paulo and also her work in Salvador de Bahia. 
And maybe um, I think I want to hear a little bit more about some of her beginnings in Italy, which are perhaps not as well known. And you know how you know we also spoke about how Lena grew up really and was part of a generation that was seeing a lot of construction under Benito Mussolini, and there were a lot of debates at the time about the role of artists and architects in society. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, those discussions at the time, her work perhaps with Gio Ponti and Carlo Pagani and how these debates at the end really shaped her architectural and design language. Mm -hmm. um, I'll try to be very short because this is a very complex question. <laughs> but what it makes me think about, and um, because we're talking about architecture doing fascism and her, and her youth, um, and being a professor myself, uh, I don't know if you can still hear me because. Yeah, we can hear you. I think I think you froze a little bit now. So we're gonna wait till Soiler now. I think now now it's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think what is most important for us, looking back at a hundred years ago is to understand that there's no, in, there's no um, universal definition of what architecture is. And because I also have lived in so many different places and I have been educated in Brazil, she was educated in Italy, my education is much more similar to Italy than it is to the United States. So um, what I'm trying to say is that the definition of architecture that she grew up with is that architecture is a cultural manifestation. Well, in the United States, where we are located, architecture is a kind of cultural manifestation, but it's much more tied to capital interests. It tends to be more connected to the commodity market. And so um, we have to understand that uh, during fascism, architecture was embraced as a, 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 as a means of propaganda. So Mussolini mm -hmm. uh, was perhaps a, the a statesman who built the most in uh, in the 1930s and people generally don't know that so if you um, go travel around italy most people are going to look for uh, very old historical sites but you will find a lot of fascist architecture which is very complicated just for a political ideological point of view but so that's where she grew up she actually very interestingly um, she was mussolini's neighbor her building shared um, the wall with Villa Torlonia, which is the big villa where Mussolini used to live. So when she went to architecture school, I can imagine that she was walking down the street and <laughs> he was there sleeping somewhere. So I think it's kind of funny or not. I don't know. But, um, <laughs> The, the, the other thing that is very important is not just uh, the country that differs in culture. She lived in, in Rome, which is the center of power. And all the innovation in architecture happened in Milan, in Turin, which was very close to Switzerland and France. And so her school of architecture was very connected. Her director and her professors were directly working with Mussolini in reconstructing the city as an imperial city. So she learned architecture mostly from a historical point of view and not like uh, Le Corbusier or Gropius, the Bauhaus, or even her colleagues from the north of Italy who were very invested in this idea of an industrial architecture. So I think that this helped shape a lot of her vision of architecture. So when she moved to Milan, and she used to say this as part of what you're pointing out, that she did not make herself alone, she wanted to collaborate with a friend of hers, who was um, Carlo Pagani, and uh, he worked directly with Gio Ponti, who was a very important um, architect, designer, and editor of many magazines, of one that is still exists called Domus since 1928. And he was very important in um, reimagining how uh, furniture and interior design uh, would be connected to crafts craftsmanship in Italy. So the idea that industrialization came out of an evolution of industry industrialization and not a <laughs> technical difficulties that, yeah design would come out of uh, of these craft traditions and not a break with them 
And so Lina Bobardi learned this um, in her experience to Milan, in Milan, and then she took it to her work, to her editorial work, and now all the work she Now? So just to go back and finalize this question, uh, she did, um, um, because she was a woman, because she was working in a world that was very adverse to her, um, she was quite unique, um, not only as uh, a woman, but also in her way of thinking, her temperament. So she had to negotiate all these uh, different opportunities that showed up to her. Her career was not delineated um, in the principle and she just followed it like we see, we see many artists repeating more or less what they do throughout their lives. She was like a sponge. She was there open to whatever came and uh, adapting herself to circumstances, to people. And she was extremely curious and vivacious. So I think that and passionate. So that's one of the things I like about her. <laughs> yeah, I've always been like, like curious about how she navigated all these different like bureaucracies and like the political climate, especially, you know, arriving also in Brazil in 1946, like the Brazil that she encountered at the time, you know, she was with her husband who was hired to be the director of the Museo de Arte de Sao Paulo. And um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, you know, how she navigated this world, how, how she was able, you know, to realize so many projects in a male dominated field, which to be honest, architecture is still a male dominated field. So it's quite incredible that Lena was able to achieve projects at the time um, for being a woman. Yeah, she was she was very proud of herself. Uh, she was very um, strong minded, as I said, and um, she was very determined, even though she was also a very gloomy person. But uh, she knew very well how to uh, associate herself with interesting people. And I think one of them was her husband. Many people ask about their uh, romantic life. And she was very clear always that what they had was a, she aspired to have a romantic friendship with him. She didn't see him necessarily as a lover. She never really wanted to marry anybody. Her dreams in life were not to be a mother, were to have children. So she was even irreverent with her gender uh, roles in society from the very beginning. And uh, she always uh, said that she admired the friendship that men have with each other, this kind of uh, Montaigne idea of the romantic friendship that is platonic and uh, full of uh, intellectual richness. And um, she entered the world of masculinity, imagined herself having these romantic friendships with all these men who she collaborated. Um, and her, her husband was a very influential in Italy and he was hired by a very influential man in Brazil, the Prince Magnet. Um, and so that opened up a lot of possibilities for her to do work. And I would say that uh, this gave her from the start a very privileged position, but she was always very generous and she was always very um, interested in the the authenticity of the country there is a very beautiful story when they spent six months in rio and she loved rio she didn't want to go to sao paulo and she told the story that she was fascinated by the the ministry of education and health which is this most important uh, icon of brazilian architecture based on the corbusier's idea of the the, the glass tower but she was more interested in walking around the streets and uh, observing people live, like that drawing that she made from the window of her hotel. And she used to tell, she saw many foreigners there, and she used to tell the story that she was once standing in, um, in a bar uh, and there was a German uh, uh, a writer who was there with her, and there was this guy who passed by the street and he spit, and the spit, instead of going to went to this German uh, rice uh, jacket and he called with that and she was fascinated with this uh, roughness and this uh, coarse aspect of uh, the social life in Brazil and she said in the spit of the man on Largo da Carioca which is the the plaza 
is the reality of Brazil. So uh, she she was very attracted to this uh, populace, to the everyday life, um, which has to do a little bit with her generation in Italy. There, uh, there is this kind of a near realist sensitivity, but also because she came from a um, uh, a more humble family. She was not wealthy. Her father later, who was a builder, made some money, they moved, but um, she had a very um, simple, uh, humble um, uh, childhood. I think that somehow life stories, she saw uh, these people a great empathy and she saw their ability to create things um, as being a human quality that anybody can create anything you just have to do it you don't have to follow educated rules to do that and i think that this is one of the most beautiful things in her architecture and this is perhaps one of the reasons why we are becoming so interested in what she did because we're we're in the moment of enormous crisis environmental crisis financial crisis economic crisis and um, architectural ideological crisis so she appears as this kind of a humanist, which is very welcome, I think. No, absolutely. And one of the things that, you know, really struck me during our conversations is that um, she was really taking from so many influences, so many lineages of architecture, not only architecture, but also like Spanish, Japanese architecture, even like US based architects. And um, we spoke about when she arrived in Brazil. Um, there were some discussions at the time in the uh, circles about Sao Paulo wanting to be different or distance itself from Rio de Janeiro, which was really like the style of like the Swiss architect Le Corbusier. So Sao Paulo was really looking north, right? Um, and you've mm -hmm. spoken about in, in some of your writings about how the glass house is really in the California style um, following the California case study houses. Can you, can you talk mm -hmm. a bit, little bit about this first project um, that she did mm -hmm. and how she negotiated the conditions of the construction of this home within her own um, interests? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll try to do. Um, I think what you're saying is really the big picture is that Rio was the place uh, where modern architecture somehow flourished in Brazil. Because most people don't know that in, it in Italy, but also in Brazil, there are two dictators. In Italy, there was Mussolini. And in Brazil, during the same time, there's Getulio Vargas. And like Mussolini, Getulio Vargas brought a lot of intellectuals of many different uh, um, beliefs uh, and artists to work with him and used architecture also as um, a means of pr uh, propaganda. So, uh, but Rio, we should not forget, had been a capital of uh, Brazil for a long time, and even the capital in the uh, 19th century of the Portuguese empire. So Rio has this kind of aristocracy in it. And uh, this aristocracy had always been connected to France uh, for many different reasons that I'm not going to even talk about here. But, uh, and so Rio is the old city, it's the formal city, even though everybody associated with, uh, with Carnival, which is not always true. And Sao Paulo is a much younger city that boomed very quickly uh, after the 1930s. And uh, it, was, it boomed because of industrialization, which was very influenced by the United States. And there was also a difference in the education of architects in these two cities, like in Rome and Milan in Italy. Sao Paulo corresponds to Milan and Rome corresponds to Rio. In a way that Milan and Sao Paulo um, had their education based on engineering schools, which is, uh, you know, my lineage. And um, in Rio the, and also in Rome, they were based on academic uh, learning or in the French Beaux-Arts instruction. So this made uh, these two schools of architecture very different. And because um, uh, Rio capitalized a lot of the, of the architecture during the regime between 1930 and 45, it was not until uh, 1945, 46 that Sao Paulo started to grow as a new center of architecture. And now it's very interesting because after the war, the United States was very careful about um, political, geopolitical interests. So Nelson Rockefeller, who wanted to create museum of, museums of art all over Latin America, 
was very close mm -hmm. to Chateaubriand, who hired Pietro Maria Bardi to be the creator of the museum. So there are all these very interesting connections that started to happen actually between the two countries that most people don't know. And Nelson uh, Rockefeller we sent Richard Neutra. Richard Neutra, yeah. I was just going to mention Richard Neutra. Yes, sent him to, like, uh, to Puerto Rico, where you come from, to the Caribbean, to document the relationships between architecture and climate. And Neutra became very interested in Sao Paulo architects and vice versa. So he actually uh, even hired Niemeyer to design a house in California that is, exists, most people don't know. And there was a, a very specific architect whose name is Oswaldo Bratke, uh, who um, designed his architecture a lot based on Neutra's architecture. And Bratke was the architect who developed the new subdivision where Lina Bobardi's house was created. And all the subdivision and the houses in it, the showroom houses, the one he designed and the one that she was hired to design, were supposed to emulate this idea of the American suburb. And uh, which is very beautiful because it was a complete innovation in Brazil. And um, so if you look at what was happening in California in, 19, in the post-war period, it was immediately, almost immediately being translated in Sao Paulo. Written a few editorials in Italy in 1944, when she was talking about this relationship between nature and architecture and using examples of um, houses in the American Southwest and also examples of these um, houses uh, in California. So she was very informed about all of this. But at the same time, it was not her only legacy. She was Italian, it was not American. So the city that you're talking about was in operation in her mind. So she had to negotiate not only uh, with the commissioner, the architect, the, the developer, her husband. And there's no documentation that tells exactly how the story happened. But if you look at the object itself, and if you look at the drawings, there are many drawings for the development of the house for a couple of years, it's really astonishing to see that the first one has a house that is um, built on rocks and uh, concrete base coming out of the ground like stones. And uh, the columns of the house were supposed to be used and uh, it was nothing industrial. And so, but if you look at the plan, it's a very gridded, it's very modernist. So it's hybrid in, in that way. And uh, so I think that, that uh, in the negotiation process, at the end, uh, what happened is that the visible part of the house, which is the glass encased, uh, glass menagerie, as I sometimes like to call it, it was exposed to the to uh, potential even uh, buyers of this neighborhood, was the place that she couldn't touch. But then the back of the house, which was a service, uh, um, areas of the house. She had complete freedom and, and she had a um, uh, pizza and uh, you know very rustic oven built and uh, the, the kind of materials she used are completely related to vernacular. Rural architecture has nothing to do with the industrial materials inside. So it's, um, you know, just to complete this, uh, is uh, this idea of hybrid culture, hybrid architecture came from me from Garcia Cantlini, who is a Mexican anthropologist who described popular culture as having this ability to enter and leave modernity as they wish. So they take whatever is important from modernism, from moder modernization, from industrialization, and they transform it in their everyday lives. So there's a kind of a transgressive uh, transgression or transgressive action in uh, incorporating uh, what is modern and making it vernacular instead of incorporating what is vernacular and making it modern. And I think Lina Bobardi went b uh, back and forth in, in these two directions. I don't know if this makes sense. No, I love it because I think what you're pointing out is something that we've discussed, like how her work is this pendulum that oscillates between the international style and more vernacular organic architecture. And um, I remember seeing some of the early drawings from the Museo de Arte de Sao Paulo, which had very much a lot of influence from Antonio Gaudí. It had um, plant, planters hanging from the walls. It had stones embedded in, in some of the, the plants. 
but there were some some concessions that she had to make for the building to be structurally feasible, which I'm sure something similar happened with the glass house. And um, I find that fascinating also that, you know, her interest in organic architecture does not, you know, necessarily only come from her time in Brazil, but comes from her friendship with Bruno Sevi back in Italy. Like Bruno Sevi, you know, went to Harvard and um, was a, a, you know, admirer of Frank Lloyd Wright and brought all of that knowledge back to Italy and shared it with Lena. So can can you talk a little bit about you know this connection with the Midwest that I find so fascinating between you know mm -hmm. some of the designs that was led to the Sao Paulo um, and mm -hmm. the Mies van der Rohe, the Crown Hall, and also some of um, the ideas around Frank Lloyd Wright's um, architecture. Yeah, yeah, this is fascinating because. I think we we lost Soiler there for a second. Let's see if uh, he reconnects. Sorry, I'm back. You're back. Uh <laughs> So I'll try to just I, quickly. Can you talk? Can you hear me? Now. I know our yeah, time now. is running short, so I'll try to be um, uh, short as possible. But it's interesting that both of us, we are in the Midwest, and um, right. there is all this transit of ideas that we wouldn't expect to find in her work. And uh, she was very close friends with Bruno Zevi, who uh, had to leave uh, Italy because he was Jewish. There were colleagues in Rome. In 1938, we went to start at Harvard, and he became very interested, and he became a translator of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's books, but also his ideas, and he created this movement called Organic Architecture in Rome. Now, you're back. Brazil, she continued to... Uh, send letters and they kept exchanging this very uh, heated uh, debate about what organic architecture was. And um, so there was that uh, tributary in her, um, okay, we have two questions. <laughs> there was that tributary in her mindset came from, that came from uh, Bruno Zevi, but there was also this interest in, uh, in uh, American architecture. So if you look at the genesis of the Museum of Art, it's based on another project that she did in 1951, which was supposed to be a museum on the beach. And that museum, mm -hmm. if you look at the drawings, they look very similar to the Crown Hall at the uh, uh, Illinois Institute of Technology uh, in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. So, uh, but instead of building it with uh, in steel, she decided to build with uh, with concrete. But after that, um, you know, she started to read uh, about. Would write from Bruno Zevi, but she was also interested in um, Gaudi in Spain. So the museum became kind of a fusion between the two. So the structure was very Miss van der Rohe, but the volume itself was just like the house that I showed earlier, which is this enclosed block covered with uh, pebbles and and stones and tree and uh, plants. But it was not possible to build because the structure was. Uh, not able to hold the weight of all of that. And for years she fought uh, to keep it that way, but at the end they had to uh, um, surround the building with this um, glass encasement, and, which transformed her idea. So uh, just to conclude it, um, I would like to say that if we look at both the glass house and the Museum of Art of Sao Paulo, not knowing the genealogy of the ideas, we tend to think that from the start, uh, from the conception, there were supposed to be these international style buildings. 
but there are not. Actually, there were negotiations uh, that came from the outside that she ended up having to give in to technical reasons, uh, financing, um, other people who participated in the project and so on. So I think it, it tells us about her ability to be flexible. And um, she was not a doctrinaire, but she was, um, uh, she was very open-minded, which I think is wonderful. So we do have one, a couple of questions that I want to um, read here for our audience. So one of the questions is, how can you compare Lena's approach with um, colleagues like Nehemiah? <laughs> um, <laughs> I think it's really comparing more than apples and oranges is like comparing maybe watermelons with tomatoes. <laughs> um, so it has to do with this difference between the two schools of uh, Sao Paulo and, uh, and Rio, basically. Niemeyer was an exponent of this architecture of the regime, of Getulio Vargas' regime. And he pursued a way of designing a building that was very much based on this, um, on this uh, expressive uh, Beaux-Arts tradition, even though his shapes are, um, are very modern and the technology is very modern, especially in the beginning. He very much uh, uh, looked at architecture from a visual point of view. And I believe Lina Bobardi looked at architecture from the inhabitation, from the life that happens in it. Um, of course, she also looked at architecture formally and aesthetically. But she always said that um, architecture, the, the protagonists of architecture are human beings and uh, not form, not the building, not the space itself. And Niemeyer uh, actually had a much more top-down view on architecture and the city. Uh, you know, uh, all the example of his architecture is very imposed, is, is the architecture of the prince, in my opinion. And uh, while in the Bobardis tends to work with the project from the program, from the way the people live, from the inside out. So this, you know, in a very short way, would be my way of um, responding to that question. Mm -hmm. Right. And we also have another uh, comment more so that we didn't really touch on. So um, we both know that, you know, Lina spent some time in Salvador de Bahia, where she was interested in the Candomblé religion. And I'm going to take that into a little segue to really kind of um, maybe you can talk about um, how, you know, she was there. For, I think it was in and out for about six years from 1958 to like um, the early 60s. How did this experience shape her practice? And also, do you think that um, some of this interest in popular culture obviously, you know, comes from also from her Italian education, I would say. Mm -hmm. Do you think that sometimes this experience has been a little bit mythologized or romanticized as having too much influence on her work? Um, it has mythologized, been mythologized because it's very beautiful. It's an incredible phase of her life and it's an incredible phase in the, in the cultural life of the country. Um, I believe that what is really interesting about that is that it was the moment of emancipation in her life and in her career. This is, uh, she was, um, how old was she? 46 years old when she went to Salvador. She was already an adult woman. She was, she had already a lot of experience and she went there to direct an art museum, which she had never done in her life. But she directed an art museum with all the curatorial experience, the editorial experience, but also as an architect and also someone with all this tradition of Italian. I think we lost Soiler again for a little bit. Are you back? <laughs> Sorry, AT&T is not very friendly. It's bad advertisement for them. <laughs> but um, so anyway, what I would say is that um, she really became who she wanted to become uh, as an architect, as a public intellectual as well. 
uh, of course, uh, the, the dialogues that she was able to open there, Salvador was a place where there was a new avant-garde in Brazil, and uh, I believe was a really fertile ground for many of her ideas. And she became a very influential person in the middle of all that. One aspect that I think is important to remember is that she had a wonderful collaboration for a couple of years only, but with a man whose name is uh, Eros Martin Gonçalves, who was a theater director, very intelligent and with a uh, very similar mindset as her. And both of them started to work with theater. And so her architecture, her uh, curatorial work gained this new uh, light of theatricality and the scene and uh, the, the letting go of Brecht and Camus who were these uh, writers and uh, directors that uh, she started to be more um, interested in. So uh, if this is the moment when she solidifies her position, but she also starts to let go of many concerns that she had um, about um, stylistic issues, and she really embraced the place in which she lived. And I, the last thing I would say is that I believe uh, Salvador is the city in Brazil that mostly reminds us of Rome because it's a city from the 1600s and uh, it is full of ruins like the ruins that she didn't like when she lived there um, but it also had this novelty which is this very strong African culture the popular culture from the hinterlands of the country which absolutely fascinated her as what she saw as the authentic um, source of Brazilian design, like the spit of the man on the jacket of the German writer. I mean, there's also this very sort of romanticization of the of the Northeast, right? Um, yeah. In, in some of the mm -hmm. writings and some of the projects. Um, and I think mm -hmm. what you mentioned about the collaborations is really important because she was in conversation with Pierre Berger, with Robert Rocha, with all these different, you know, intellectuals that were there at the time, and um, you know, reading even like you know Paulo Freire and and all these different, you know, kind of like an intellectual tradition that really comes from from the northeast of Brazil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's correct. And you lived in Recife yourself, and Recife was an even more important center of mm -hmm. uh, of popular movements. And uh, one thing that most people don't know and are not aware, because this is part of the mythology that allows, uh, you know, eclipses the reality, is that Lina Bobardi was, uh, she had many different phases in these very few years since she was in Salvador. She had wonderful collaborators in the beginning, but under political pressure, she lost all of them and she saw herself alone there. And uh, she had to look for other connections. And she saw a model in these popular cultural movements in Recife to revise her projects for the museum and uh, the Museum of Popular Art and this design, uh, a design school that she wanted to create based on these um, uh, traditions of uh, popular handcraft, which um, were these spontaneous forms of creating things and out of pure necessity and uh, not as design as we know, but uh, I think that uh, what you would see uh, perhaps in the United States is still today in states like Alabama, if you go to the hinterland and you see uh, quilts and, uh, you know, a G's band quilts me makes me think a lot about the reality that Lina Bobardi found in, in, in Salvador in the 1960s. But uh, she, even there, she had to um, find new alliances and new affiliations to keep her dream alive. And um, sometimes she could not realize them. Sometimes she could. And she brought all that to Sao Paulo for the inauguration of the Maspi in 1968, which was really a provocation, right? To like the elites, the cultural elites at the time. Exactly. And this is the other thing that most people don't remember. We always associate the museum with this incredible set of glass easels, but the museum has two floors. So you enter the museum from below and the first room that you see is actually a gallery where she uh, started the, uh, she opened the museum with this, um, exhibition called The Hand of the Brazilian People, which was a collection of hundreds of these everyday life objects. It was beautifully displayed um, with her incredible sophisticated Italian taste. 
uh, theatrically organized. Um, you know, I could describe this for hours. It's really beautiful. And it was even reconstituted in the museum a couple of years ago in a, in a very rigorous way, beautifully done. And so you have to imagine that the people who lined up to see this museum for the first time, the first thing that they saw was not Rembrandt, Matisse, uh, Renoir, or Di Cavalcanti. It was actually these anonymous objects, which was a celebration of what she thought Brazilian art really was. And it was not just uh, Lina Bobardi, it was also Pietro Maria Bardi, her husband. So they had this very strong intellectual connection, uh, you know, in their, um, in their romantic friendship. They were incredible um, uh, interlocutors of this project for a Brazilian civilization, so to speak. So I have like one one final question before we move into, I want to talk a little bit about your book, but I think one of the most iconic images that has circulated is, you know, her incredible concrete and glass easels, which has influenced so many artists, Isaac Julian, I mean, Tatiana Truve, Olafur Ellison, I could go on and on and on. Can you, can you talk about where do you think this idea comes from? Because I know it's very complicated. I know we don't have a lot of time. But I think it's really interesting how it also comes from an Italian lineage of exhibition making and display that was already really flourishing, you know, in the 1940s. Can you talk a little bit about how she coalesced some of these ideas into this iconic um, display? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll try to be very brief. Uh, it comes from a tradition from the 1930s as well of exhibiting art works that has to do with a group of architects from Milan. And I think the most prominent of them is Franco Albini, who uh, started to exhibit works of art and paintings on um, metal rods and uh, these connectors so that the painting would look like it was floating in the middle of the room. So it's trying to detach the works from the wall. And Pietro Maria Bardi also did that in his own gallery. He would put the paintings that would be to, to be sold, like from the Renaissance or from the 19th century, on easels. But for him, and then Lina Bovardi adapted this thought, he wanted to show um, the painting not as an artwork full of this aura of the special thing that a human, a very enlightened human being did, but he just wanted to show that it was there, left just one minute after the painter left and it was still drying. So this idea that a painting is human work is not necessarily work of art that we tend to think is something very, very special. So it's a way of desacralizing the, the, the artwork and then putting it in direct context with the viewer. So the glass easels are this ideology that everybody is creative. Everybody can do something as long as they want. Everybody can draw, everybody can be a painter. And this is not, it's, you, some people may think that this is populism, but I think it is actually very authentic and very genuine. It's this, um, so that's why you have in the museum these two uh, exhibitions opening. So if you see um, a carved piece of wood that is an ex voto that is taken to a church after someone gets better from a disease and is deposited and is carved by hand has the same value as a highly sophisticated painting by done by Rembrandt, who is interested in studying the light and shadow and the expression of the face. So it's a celebration uh, of human life, a celebration of human creativity uh, in all forms. So it's, it's this, um, it's, it's really the sacralized, it's putting the work of art naked of any information, any uh, pre-given symbolism. It's like the first time you see it and it's your encounter with it, completely um, just you and what is in front of you. And I think this is profoundly beautiful and, um, um, and it has been many times been criticized and misinterpreted, but um, I'm very glad that the museum has reconstituted that. No, it's wonderful. And I love this concept of painting as labor and sort of, you know, having it stand on its own merits without, you know, the burden of context or history. It's available to you if you want to access it at the back of the easel, but it's not a precondition to understand the actual mm -hmm. work. And I think that's, that's quite, yeah. quite an achievement. 
Um, before we end, we're almost at the end of our time. I wanted to briefly talk about your upcoming book because I am very excited to read your biography on Lena Babardi. Maybe you can give us a little taste of, you know, what will be revealed about Lena that we don't know. Like, tell us a little bit about, you know, how this book um, has um, come about and, and some of the things that, you know, we can find in it. Mm -hmm. Um, I published a book um, a few years ago um, that was a monograph showing her work, but also had to do with her life and her uh, the context in which she lived. And um, uh, the more I studied Lina Bobardi, which I have been doing for 20 years, the more I tried to understand her work, it, uh, I became more fascinated with the person who was behind it. And a few years ago, uh, I was in conversation with Julia Busius, who is the editor of Compania das Letras, who is a, a wonderful publishing house in Brazil. And uh, we started to develop this idea of having a, uh, a biography about Lina Bobardi. But I was involved in other projects and I didn't have much time to do that. And it's also a huge project. So finally, um, about a year and a half ago, we signed a contract to do it and I started to you know, set down to write this biography. And I had a very large manuscript of uh, 1200 pages. So I kind of tried to distill it and pull back all the architecture and bring it, her life forward. But I did it uh, having already known a lot about her life and having read other documents and letters and uh, being very intrigued about what it meant to write a biography about someone who I didn't know, that I have known very profoundly and who um, had a very difficult life. So um, I decided, and, and you know, when I did the exhibition in Pittsburgh, I read a very generous review um, of the exhibition that said that the work that I had done had been done with rigor and tenderness. And I thought, oh, that's wonderful. I would like to write this book out of compassion, out of uh, um, tenderness and perhaps give her the love that she never really had in her life. So I felt like this responsibility of uh, telling the truth, but at the same time being um, truthful to her and to the documents. And I think what happens, and you're talking about myth in the beginning, uh, the dilemma that I faced for a long time was, you know, have to do with three concepts. One of them, they're philosophical concepts. One of them is the myth itself. And the other um, is the is what sits in the middle, which is the opinion, which is what journalists do. And the other one, scientifically, I am I am a researcher. I am I'm, you know I'm a human scientist. So uh, the I think we lost Euler again to produce knowledge. So um, I have to work with a spectrum between opinion, myth, and knowledge in a way that I can understand the myth that she created about herself, look for documents that can support that or not. And so it has been a very, um, a very uh, exhaustive work of uh, trying to compose a narrative that uh, in which I try to put myself the least possible, but uh, of course, I'm there, but also to bring up uh, issues about uh, her own creative conflicts and her obsessions, her difficulties, and uh, what it meant to be a woman, what it meant to be a foreigner, what it meant to uh, strive for ideas that were sometimes against the current, and um, her own solitude. And uh, I think just to, sorry, can you still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you still hear me? Yeah, okay. Just to summarize, and I used to, I, I found this uh, very beautiful and poignant uh, sentence uh, by Pier, uh, Pier, uh, Paolo Pasolini, which I decided to use as the epigraph of the, bill, of the book, in which he answers to a question to a journalist uh, about what freedom meant to him. He said, well, uh, my freedom has to do with my life. And he said, my independence is my strength, but it implies my solitude, which is my weakness. And so I see this tension between Little Bobardi's independence and solitude, her strength and her weaknesses. 
And I try to do this, um, um, this balancing act in the most humane and the most uh, interesting and um, also compassionate way with rigor, but also with tenderness. So I hope that you will be able to find that in the 500 pages of this <laughs> biography <laughs> that should be coming out soon. Yeah. I don't know how much that translates into into published book, but uh, yeah, it's a manuscript of 500 pages. <laughs> I'm sure you could have written thousands of pages on her incredibly fascinating life. We have a comment here from Adriana Herrera, rigor and tenderness is a perfect combination, which I think is nice. We have a request to Thanks. see um, this chair, which I think you're sitting on. Is that true, Soiler? You own one of yes, Lina's chairs? I am, but, yes, I am, <laughs> but I'm trying. I don't know what's happening to my phone. Ah, here I am back. Sorry. Yeah, you're back. Can you still we want to see uh, <laughs> the chair. <you're> on. <laughs> Which is no, her folding chair. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So here's a chair. Okay. Can you see there you this? Go. Here's a chair that she designed. Oh, I can. Yeah. yeah. There you go. So this chair is based on a um, Tuscan chair that is actually based on a Roman chair. So you have to imagine, uh, you know, that is a source, but she wanted to make this for a theater and it should be pliable. So the chair could be moved around, which had to do with her own concept of architecture, that uh, people had freedom to inhabit the place. So you would arrive at this theater in Salvador and you would go to the corner, pick up a chair, and um, sit wherever you want it. So I think, you know, this notion of freedom and humanity is very, very um, appropriate to understand her architecture. And I see that perhaps that's the most important legacy of uh, how she thought and what she produced in her mm -hmm. life. That's such a beautiful way to end this conversation, this concept of like freedom and how freedom is manifested through architecture and, and through design. Um, it's been such a pleasure to speak with you, Soiler. I, it always is. Um, I'm so excited that we met this year, that I was able to see your show in Pittsburgh, which was incredible. Um, very, very rigorous, as you say, it really was. Um, and I also want to thank the, the 55 Project, you know, for inviting us to get together here and have this online conversation in quarantine. I really appreciate it. Yes, thank you, uh, Carla and Flavia. It was wonderful <laughs> to have this conversation again. You know, um, COVID gave us a lemon, and so we're trying to make a lemonade out of it. That's right. Like, we're improvising like yeah. Lena would do, right? That's what... Yes, and she would <laughs> like a caipirinha, so let's make a caipirinha. <laughs> Great. I think it's happy hour over here in Chicago, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, everybody. everybody. Thank you for the audience who is out there. <laughs>